thank you. So, I'm Miguel Ojeda. Uh, it's the first time I'm here in Kernel Recipes. I am not a known uh, maintainer or anything like that, so I basically don't know almost any of you. But, uh, well, I am here because Willie invited me to, to give a talk about, uh, well, an example of how we use uh, Linux and the kernel in, in, uh, at CERN for the, uh, in this case, for the LAC beam monitoring, which I will explain uh, soon. So, what is CERN? In case uh, I don't know who, how many people here knows what CERN is, just in case I can go fast. Okay, perfect. <laughs> perfect then. <laughs> So I can skip that then. Uh, what you know is European, it's research, it's not, it's not academic. Some people make the uh, distinction, it's important in some cases. Um, and it was created for high energy physics, basically. It's uh, in Switzerland, in Geneva, in the northwest. Uh, uh, here in the map, there is a pointer, maybe. Uh, someone has a pointer. Okay. Where are you? Here. Okay, so basically this, uh, this is where Geneva ends, basically. This is a village here, Megan. And, uh, sorry, my friend is, ah, oh, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, so this is the village, uh, it's uh, called Megan, it's basically in the edge uh, of Geneva, and it's where CERN, starts and where the tram, if you go by the tram, uh, you arrive in the last stop of, uh, of Switzerland. Basically, this is the, the, the purple line is the, uh, the, the border between uh, France and Switzerland. So if you see this triangle here, or quasi-triangle is, um, is CERN, is the campus, one of them. And it's actually crossing, the, the official line is crossing, but actually the, the you know, the, uh, the territory is not owned by any state, uh, so the, the member states just uh, gave it uh, kind of for free for to, the, to the organization and they don't own the territory. I'm not speaking here officially as CERN, I don't know all the rules, so I am just telling what uh, I know about it. So if I make any mistakes uh, don't, about this, don't blame me for it. But basically, uh, just a quick thing that maybe you don't know, for instance, the police of France or, or or Switzerland have to ask, uh, or even the pompiers, the, 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 the firemen, uh, have to ask for permission to the director general to, to go in into the organization because it's supposed to be like an university, right, in many countries where, you know, the, the, the limits of the university are uh, forbidden for the normal authorities, in theory. So, the origins, uh, well, you can see I will go a bit fast on this. Uh, it was founded uh, more than 60 years ago. And originally, it was meant for, for, you know, discovering what was in the inside of the atom. So that's why they call it uh, nuclear. That's why the name is nuclear. But nowadays, uh, it's not actually, uh, they, they go and be beyond that. This is the council found in CERN in a meeting. This is the first uh, dig at the site of CERN. And nowadays, which is uh, what I am going to talk about, it's basically particle physics, is what it's called nowadays. Maybe tomorrow they change the name again. Uh, and it's an international effort. So to give you some, uh, you know, some range of numbers or some uh, how big it is to answer you, it's 22 member states right now. Three more are going to become probably member states soon. Then there are five associate member states. Then there are big observers, organizations or countries, which uh, like uh, you know the USA, Russia. Yeah, yeah. Japan, uh, European Union, uh, UNESCO, etc. There are many other people and many other universities, as you can see, 600 uh, universities associated with it or with contacts of that to work at CERN. So this is the entrance with all the flags and all that thing. So, who are the, uh, the, the maintainers, right, of, uh, of, of uh, CERN? Because some people, I, I usually talk about this because some people uh, think, which is normal, I, I also thought that, uh, I also thought that when you go to CERN, you think everyone there is physicist, right? Uh, is, everyone is a physicist and everyone... Uh, so actually, no. Actually, the physicists are a minority. I mean, people are working as physicists. Okay, there are many physicists, but they are not working, are working as, uh, as physicists. They are working as uh, engineers, most of them. 
Uh, but what there are, which are not CERN, it's not uh, staff uh, members, basically they are not paid directly by CERN, there are uh, 12,000 people uh, working there, uh, plus the other 2,000 plus, so it's, it's quite big. There is a lot of people from all over the world, I mean it's, it's a mixture of uh, everyone basically. Uh, and now, uh, well I could have put these slides before, but since I didn't know how many people knew about CERN, I, I put them after explaining CERN. So I am a software engineer, I worked at CERN for seven years. Um, I worked first in the physics department, working on several things that maybe I will speak later about. Um, in the later part, I worked in the real-time control systems of uh, radio frequency for the accelerators. About the kernel, because nobody knows me here, so I put this slide. Uh, I worked my first kernel patch in 2006. After a while, I, I wrote a couple of simple drivers. After reading the Greg's uh, LLD book, uh, please update it. Um, I am the maintainer of a small tree with a few drivers there, and I like, uh, well, I do some papers on C++, so I don't tell Linux, so yeah. So let's get to the fun, let's get to the, to the fun stuff. So particle physics in, in nine steps, okay? This is the nine steps that you can say uh, you have to do to do particle physics nowadays. So the first thing is you accelerate particles, right, to the speed of light, almost. Not, of, of course, not up to the speed of light, but almost there. Then you just, you know, you put them in a circle, you spin them around the circle, and then you, you make them one, one, you know, one beam goes, goes in one direction and the other beam goes in the other direction, and then you smash them at some location that we will see. This, not explosion, but let me use the term, okay? The explosion that happens there uh, generates a lot of stuff, and you have to somehow detect what happens there. Then, because there is so much data there, it's so, so much data, you have to actually, uh, you know, filter most of it. I don't know the percentage, sorry, but uh, it's, you can say the immense majority of the data is thrown away already directly in the electronics. Then we will see there are other steps. After what you know, what is basically what looks important, you store what is left and you say, okay, this is important, I, I will put it uh, in, the, in a huge, uh, you know, distributed system. Then you repeat this every 25 nanoseconds for months and months and months, years, basically. You repeat this for years. Then you have physicists in parallel. Okay, this step, I put it in, in like a serial process, but it's actually, you know, from here to there, it's in parallel with here, from here to here. Basically, the last three steps are done by physicists. The first other steps are done by uh, engineers, mostly, and physicists. So you analyze the, you analyze the resulting data, sorry, which is not easy because actually CERN has a lot of problems to get, you know, get some, as, as I know, you know, take this with a grain of salt, but as I know, uh, they always look for more opportunities to, to have resource, computing resources to, to, to run the simulations, to run the analysis, because it's very computer expensive, uh, and they are always short, you know, on that. Then, finally, you test if what you get is what the, whatever theory you are trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, whatever th theory predicts, you, are t you, you, you see if the, the statistical tests say that uh, it's actually what is happening there or not. And then you get an overpriced like, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, the other uh, few years ago that, uh, uh, not CERN, but uh, two, two, collider, two detectors that I will explain uh, got a, a mention in the Nobel Prize. So the accelerators, basically, if you go to the web page of CERN, they put three big categories of what CERN is. I don't exactly agree with them, but it's a nice way to, to, to explain it. There is the accelerators, there is the detectors, and there is the computing part, if you want, of the software part, if you want to be more general, okay? So the first part is accelerators. Most people think that CERN is only about this, and everything is there, but actually, uh, I would say that most of the work is probably on the other side. So. The accelerators, probably you know about the LEC, right? Most of you know about the LEC, it's, it's in the news, it's creating black holes and all that stuff. Uh, it's a famous one, if you ask people, it's the one that they know. But actually what people usually don't know is that this is actually the last particle accelerator, it's actually the last step. But there is a few other 
that you can see in the bottom, you have a linear accelerator, which is now the two, but later will be the four in 20, uh, 2020. Then you have the PS booster, then the PS, then the SPS, and the DLC. So all it starts in a waterfall of hydrogen that you can see, you can visit. And then they, took, they take um, some of the uh, particles, depends on the experiment, what they t take, and so on and so forth. But basically, they take the particles that they, that they want to use for an experiment, then they send, it, they send the particle or the bunch of particles into uh, the next accelerator. It's a linear one, as I said. They accelerate it to some energy. I will explain that later. Then you, you have the, the PSB, which increases the energy, then the PS, etc., etc. In the end, what you are doing is going step by step. Why is this done? I don't exactly know why is this exactly done like this, but probably the reason is because they were built. Let me see if I can. Okay, maybe, I don't know, maybe I, well, it doesn't matter, I, I do it with. So, probably what happened is that they built them roughly in this order. So these are the smaller ones. You do some physics with the smaller ones. Then when you need uh, more, uh, more energy, you need to increase the energy. You have to build another one to increase the energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they do what they can what the with the resources that they have because I think it's $10 billion in 20 years, uh, in the last 20 years that were used for this. So you can imagine it's, it's, it's quite a, but expensive, so you cannot. You, you have to do. The physicists are doing a great job to 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 use whatever funding they can get to to, to do the physics they need. This is the the, the hydrogen bottle. The Linux four. There is another one in Linux. Uh, this is the one in Linux two. There is another one in Linux four. This is actually the whole complex of accelerators. So. Well, there are several ones that I don't talk about. You know, these are other experiments that maybe later I can mention if there is time, but basically in the end, you arrive, this is start, you may accelerate protons or ions, and they go to some other, uh, it's, all this, uh, it's another experiment, but usually what we are going to talk about, they go to the booster, then the PS booster, sorry, the booster, then the PS, then the SPS, and then finally the, the LEC, which was called LEP. Well, it was not called LEP, it was another accelerator built in the same tunnel, okay? Then they reuse the tunnel to avoid, you know, making another tunnel, which is a lot of uh, money, because the tunnels for the LEC, for example, is um, around 100 meters underground. Okay, so you know, building the whole infrastructure, putting it down in the in the in the underground takes uh, uh, some civil engineering uh, money. Um, I could have put some pictures of that. It's quite. Uh, I have some videos and, and so on, but we will see if there is time. Please, someone can tell me when I have uh, 20 minutes, maybe, in case I, I drift too much. So, the accelerators, to end, to end with this. So the beams right now are accelerated, the, the protons are accelerated to 6.5 tera electron volts, which, to give you some scale, is nothing. Okay? Physicists say, or people say, wow, it's incredible, it's the it's the best we can achieve right now in, in the world, right? But actually, that is, is almost no energy. It's just one micro joule, okay? But for a proton, if you make the equation for a proton, giving the energy of one micro joule to a proton, you arrive basically at the speed of light. Actually, just 11 kilometers per hour less than the speed of light, okay? And basically, they go around at 11,000 RPM in the 27 kilometers that the accelerator takes, okay? So it's like a small motorbike uh, engine, but you make it huge and, and you have that uh, angular, uh, same angular velocity. So uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the special relativity, but I am not going to talk about much, but basically this is the classical, the first equation that we have here is the classical kinetic energy, right? The one that we know all about. And then Einstein came and said that, well, actually, the total energy of a particle due to its mass, to its own, basically, is that one. If you take the Taylor expansion of that, fun of that function to around V0, you arrive to that uh, expression, OK? So this is the Taylor expansion. And you see here that this term is actually that one, OK? Basically, that's the kinetic energy. That's where it comes from. Okay, 
the one is much bigger, of course. This term is much bigger. But this is, of course, this energy does not include everything this one includes, okay? The first term is the one that is the energy due to the mass at rest of the particle, okay? When the particle is at rest, you have that much energy, which is, let's say, million joules. While the other one, as I said, is maybe nothing. So it's a completely different order, okay? And then you have the other relativistic terms that are used for GPS and other applications, you know, that you have to take into account this so that GPS works and so on. So there's, these are the three, three things. If you look at the plot, you see this is the one at velocity zero, and this is the, the asymptote. I don't know if I pronounce it right, but you understand, right? This is the asymptote. So this part is the MC square, and as you increase, the slope goes higher and higher. So what I want you to understand is that if you build an accelerator for three terastron volts, it's much, much easier, not just half easier, it's much, much easier than for six terastron volts because the slope goes higher and higher, okay? So to increase a bit more, it's like when you go in a car, you know, it takes much more energy to accelerate to 120 kilometers per hour from 100 than from 120 to, to, to 140. So increasing 20 kilometers per hour is different depending on the velocity you are, right? So how they do accelerate? What is the magic? So it's, it's, explaining it is, is easy, of course. Making it is not, but explaining it is easy. The first part is the radio frequency cavities. The radio frequency cavities, I have a video. If we have time, we will see it. What they do is create uh, uh, fields, okay? That electrical fields, electromagnetic fields that when the particles are going to pass, they switch polarity quick enough at the right time so that the particle accelerates in the direction that you want. So that is what is the only thing that makes them go fast. That's, that's it. What you studied in high school, that's the same effect. They use the physicists to do that. Then you need ultra high vacuum because otherwise the, the, you know, the protons that go in the LEC would hit other stuff. So you have to make it very, very, very clean. You know, the inside of the pipe it has to be completely vacuum, not as other single atom if you can. The more dirt, if you want, that you have inside, the, 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 the more unstable the beam will be. Then you need superconducting magnets. Okay, in part, you need a magnet to keep them in track. You use magnetic fields to make them stay in the circle, okay? The, the, the protons just go in a, in a straight line, right? They, they don't want to turn around, so. What you put is magnets all around the 27 kilometers to force them to, to go to the left or to the right. And that requires, for the LEC, eight, more than eight Teslas. That's a lot. If you remember, it's a lot of, uh, it's a very big magnet. What happens is that for making such a magnet, you need such a amount of energy that is not practical. So we need superconducting magnets. Because superconducting magnets, what happens is that it's much less expensive you want in terms of energy to reach eight Teslas done with a non-superconducting magnet, okay? And in order to make superconducting magnets, what you need is cryogenics, and you have to make them really, 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 really cold. So cold that it's actually, as I say here, colder than outer space, okay? So outer space has the cosmic microwave uh, radiation, you know, background, and it's around 2.7 uh, Kelvin. In the inside of the pipe, basically, is, well, not the inside of the pipe, sorry, the, the, ins, the, 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 the magnets are at 1.9 Kelvin. So it's, some people say, in the press probably, they say it's the coldest place in the universe. Well, we don't know if it's the coldest in the universe, but you, you get the idea, basically. We don't know any other place that is colder than that. So maybe we can see it. If I can get my, this is going to be hard to, it's very, it's a few seconds. I know why I cannot click here and pass it to the middle because it's, anyway, so short. So this is the inside of the cavity, which is usually made of brands, I think. And these are the change of polarity that you see. These are the two poles and you switch. These are the particles, so when they come, you switch so that they go faster in that direction. Then you switch again, so they go faster in that direction. If you don't switch, what happens is that you would do the, you know, the opposite of what you want in each step. So that's the trick, basically. There, of course, this is much more uh, 
complex that, uh, and, and it takes, as you can imagine, a lot of uh, you know, control systems, etc., etc. Because everything, everything in this, okay, let me, let me say one thing is a bit orthogonal, but basically at CERN, and what I will explain later about Linux, is that the complexity at CERN is actually not, let's say, uh, the complexity of an airplane, if you want, that is some system of equations that you really know how they work. You make some limits, and you make some, some engineering, and then, and then it works. Okay, in CERN, at CERN, since we don't exactly know what happens, okay, with the particles and the beams, and we cannot predict everything, and you know the materials and everything is not perfect, we cannot uh, do the same. So what we do is create a lot of systems to control that, because everything is non-linear and everything is almost impossible to, to predict. This again with a grain of salt. I am not a theoretical physicist, okay, so. Uh, so, as I said, we smash the, the, the protons, and what happens? What is the physics? We are, have not done anything. So this is the experiment part, okay? You put in a collision site that we call, you put a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, detectors around of many types, calorimeters, trackers of many kinds, many materials, a lot of uh, really fancy stuff that people that like materials uh, love. And with the, you know, with what happens, the debris that happens, because when the protons collide, they explode in an informal way of saying it, they explode in different directions. When I say they explode, they decay into other particles, okay? But we don't know what the particles are. What we know is the debris that happens to cross the detectors that you put around in a cylinder, okay? So with that hint of different kinds, and this is very complex to do, I have no idea about that, you get some hints about the speed, the mass, the charge, etc., of the particles that may have been there. Then, we, as I said, we cannot store any, everything, so we have to filter in real time with electronics and then with normal computers running Linux and saving only the things that you really think are interesting. For example, imagine that there are two protons colliding and you have a theory that says, well, with some probability, it will happen that they will decay in some other two particles, and then these two particles in another two particles, and then two particles, et cetera. And I predict that this has to be this value, this value, this value, more or less, in a, in a range. So what you do is you program electronics, an FPGA or whatever it is, to see if that is what more or less what you are getting, and if it is in the range, you save it. If not, you discard it, because that's not what you're looking for. Because it's completely random. We cannot... Uh, do that. So that's why we run it for months until we see what we want to see, basically. This is, for example, uh, this is not a fancy graphic. This is actually a, a, a event in CMS, which is one of the experiments. This is the point of collision. The LEC would go around here, okay? This would be the, the, the LEC. And in this place, there is the collision, okay? This is the detector. It's a huge reader, like this building, basically. And these are different. Um, particles or jets that uh, the detector can detect. With that is what the physicists then uh, simulate backwards to know what, uh, what happened inside. Because we are not interested in what happens with the debris. What, it, what we are interested in is what happens in the point of collision, because it's where the interesting stuff happens. For example, the Higgs boson only happens in the beginning of this chain of reactions, if you want. Okay. So you have to, basically with a simulator and, and a other software, you have to see how you can go back in time, basically to say, okay, I have these conditions. What could have been there so that I reached to that condition, okay? So you simulate, you take into account the angles of the particles, the speed, the mass, the charge, and then you arrive to the conclusion that they had to be that thing in the, in the middle, okay? I know so if that's clear. Imagine that you kick a ball, right? And, or two balls, and then you know that some probability they will go one through this way and one this way. And the ball changes into a tennis ball, okay? Let's see. So what you say is if I have a tennis ball and I have a, another uh, kind of ball that I know, then what happened is that I had in the beginning two tennis balls plus etc. okay? So what you do is with that, you go a bit back in time. Of course, you cannot, since this is all with errors and statistics, you cannot know with a single event. You have to do it many times and, and search enough until you go up to five sigma. And when you cross five sigma confidence, you say it's a discovery. It's what uh, is the is the threshold. If you can discover something at five sigma, you have a paper and you can publish it. In the case of the Higgs boson, 
It was so important, and CMS and Atlas, both independent experiments, went to Five Sigma with the Higgs boson, more or less roughly at the same time. So they announced a discovery, and that's what the Nobel Prize uh, was for uh, CMS and Atlas. Not for CMS and Atlas directly, but I mean the experiments that, uh, that uh, made it possible. Okay? So what the physics, the physicists are interested in is in this part, not accelerators. If you want, okay? Of course, they are interested, but what I mean is that the experimental physicists, they are interested on, on the experiments, not on the, not on the other part. Okay, maybe this is quick too, but I will. This is, uh, let me put it here. This is uh, Atlas. Basically, a person would be roughly this size, okay? So it's like a, let's say, 15 store, story building or, or something like that. You can go there, you can visit it when it's stopped, of course, and, and you can uh, see the thing. This is SPS, this is one of the accelerators, not the detectors. This is one of the tunnels. You cannot go inside. This is, as you know, super radioactive if you go inside with the, you know, you have to wait until they cool down and, and well, it's a lot of, uh, a bit of scary stuff. This is the LEC, but I will show something better than this. This is CMS, you can see it here better. This is smaller than Atlas. The, basically, this, you see here, this is where the, the, the pipe would be. The pipe is something like this, huh? it's not the, but the, the, the thing around the pipe is, is, is uh, a huge building around. So, I will speed up a bit. This is an overview. Uh, I only wanted to show it, well, I put it also in the videos because some people may want to see them later, uh, but I wanted to show you the, the tunnel mm -hmm. here. It's a 3D, no, 3D, um, 360 um, degree video. This is the guy with the selfie stick. <laughs> And, uh, and this is the tunnel. If you notice, you say, ah, this is straight. You said it's a circle, but it's 27 kilometers. So you are almost, almost you cannot see that it goes turning, you know. Basically, from one point to the other, you have to go by car, roughly 15 minutes by car, okay? From one point to the other, through the middle in traffic. Okay, so whoever wants to see the video can, can see it. Peter. There is much more uh, at CERN. People only talk about this normally, is what makes the headlines and so on. But there is a lot of more stuff at CERN. Many more experiments that have nothing to do even with accelerators, okay? They do antimatter, like the famous book says. They do, uh, where they decelerate the particles. Instead of accelerating, they decelerate the particles so that, you know, they, they, they can get them stable enough and, you know, uh, confined enough that they can study them for 60 minutes, I think is the record, of anti-hydrogen. They research particles that we don't know if they exist now. They is, for example, the neutrino, you heard the neutrino problem with the, you know, you heard in the news that there was an announcement that there was a problem with the cable, that they didn't know if they, they send the neutrinos from CERN to, to Italy or the other way around, and, and, and there was a problem of the timing, and they thought by mistake that they were, the neutrinos going slightly over the speed of light. Okay, which was not the case because there was a timing error of such a small degree that, uh, well. And there is, which is important for us, a lot of computer science. These are the projects that normally also make the headlines, things like the LEC computer grid, the World Wide Web, the EOS distributed system, I put it here because it's more close to the, to the kernel, there is collaboration with companies, and more technical, there is a lot of C++. Sorry, there is no C, but it's a lot of C++, roughly 50 million lines, okay? CERN is a member of the committee of C++. He was invited because they have so much uh, C++. We also use a lot of Python, okay? For, well, of course, web applications and stuff like that, but also what is used a lot is for physicists to configure the code running the simulations. So you write the simulation code in C++ and then you configure the simulation with whatever you want to do in Python. Okay, so most of the detector, for example, CMS, where I worked in, is basically huge, uh, you know, C++ classes uh, running simulations, and then Python configuring the input and output and what you do with the data. You pass it to this class, this class in C++, or what you do with the data. Then there is dozens of analysis and simulator packages, root, you may have heard about, Gen4, Monte Carlo simulation, you know, many things. It's like uh, Monte Carlo simulations, if you don't know the method, it's uh, something that was invented in a casino, you know, it's good for, well, I don't have time. Later, if you want, you can. 
Also, we do, this is what I know, okay? These are very concrete examples. I went from the official staff to the things I, I work with. We did a lot of bleeding edge, basically all the software, all the distribution, the entire distribution of Linux, as you know it, I mean, uh, the entire thing, including the, I don't know if including the kernel, but including the, the compiler, chip compiler GCC and app, all the libraries, everything, they compile it every day, several times, with the latest compilers, with all compilers and everything. So because of this, I, the, the, the technical reasons are, are long to explain, but basically because of that, they submitted quite some bugs in the compilers and so on, because it's such a huge amount of code being compiled every day that, uh, that they improve the, the compilers. Then, related to Git, we have 200k commits in, in, in the CMS uh, detector software. I work on that basically in 2010, we were in CBS, everything, CBS, 2010, CBS, okay? <laughs> We had 1,000 projects in folders. So there were 1,000 folders, okay, with different projects, and they were considered different projects, and you had to consider like different projects. And then we said, okay, let's move to Git. But the first thing we did we was uh, make a kind of a, a I made a, a system on top of on top of CBS to manage the commits that went across the different projects, okay, and across different files to make like a Git commit in CBS. Okay, so we started with that without changing the interface for the physicists because you have to remember, we cannot, I mean, mo many people, developers uh, at CERN, they are physicists, they are not software developers. They just want to run or, or code their simulation. They just want to write their equations. They don't want to, or they, are not, they don't even know how to manage or use a, a VCS, okay? So you have to do it easy to start. It's not that they're not, they are not smart. They are smarter than me, but you know, what I mean is that, uh, uh, people don't want to change. So we started like this. We changed the, the we didn't change the interface. S then uh, it went uh, like that. We improved it, improved it. We added even dependencies between, so you could make dependencies like, if, imagine that in Git you specify that you have a dependency on another patch or another commit, and you could write that. So I added that in, the, in that system so that people could say, okay, my change has to wait until the other change because they are, there, there are no, let's say it's maintainers like in the Linux kernel that take care of a small part. Basically, many physicists have to take touch different things. So what happens is that uh, people work in their own laptops for a long time, maybe two years, okay? Because they are making their PhD thesis, okay? And then they have to integrate the stuff. So you have to organize and, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit uh, difficult. And then there's actually people employed, which I was in the team, employed to make a sense of all that and organize all the commits. So it has to be full-time people organizing all that. So you cannot rely on uh, uh, people in universities all around the world doing it by, by themselves. And then we, in 2013, we actually moved to GitHub Everything. We actually made, gave GitHub some problems because the, the repository was so huge and so on that they had problems visualizing the, the commit messages and there was some, uh, uh, it was okay. Eh? They solved everything very quickly and, and it was very nice since, since then. And people got accustomed and, and it's fine. If you want to learn more about CERN, you can go to uh, home CERN. Yes, they bought the, the extension. And this is the project I work in. Okay, it's called the OSBOX, the observation box. And it's just to give you an example of the kernel and what we do with the, in the LC about the kernel and, and what we use Linux for. So I said that we have beams, right, in, in, the, in the accelerators. So in some systems, because they are all highly nonlinear, you have to make a feedback, a feedback, basic controlling. You know, if you have worked with control systems, you know that you basically you make a feedback loop and then you keep controlling the thing to make it, uh, to keep it stable, okay? For example, if you want to move the beam or you want to uh, stretch the beam a bit, okay, you have to, it's not a simple, you know, number that you change. You have to change a lot of stuff around all the accelerator to make it work. And because every single thing in the accelerator maybe have different constraints or different behavior, or even you don't even know how it works. For example, I work at Isol once time. Uh, Isol is another experiment. Uh, we had a, a, a kind of a, a field that we have to generate, and the voltage that we put to generate the field we thought it was not linear, so we wrote an application to control it. So the operators could say, "Ah, put this, uh, this, um, I think it was this intensity in the in the in the field. I want this intensity, so you have to apply this voltage." And the curve was something strange. So we wrote a software to to compute the curve, go through the all the points, compute the curve, save it, and then 
apply the right, uh, do the inverse, to apply the right uh, voltage to get the, the, the field that you want. What happened is that when we build it, we realized that it's not even, it was not, it has some kind of a state or memory or hysteresis, you know, so you cannot even do that. So there was some variation when you, when you change it. So it's so, so what I mean to say is that it's so nonlinear and it's so complex that you cannot really uh, normally make simple uh, control systems. So you have to rely on feedback loops, etc. So originally in the LEC, this was for the LEC, you could read in the radio frequency cavity, you could read some data, basically a few milliseconds of bunch by bunch data, which is, you know, in the LEC you have like 3,000 uh, packets of particles that you launch. It's not really a beam, like continuous beam. It's not a railgun, okay? It's actually uh, like a pulse, let's say. So what happened is that physicists could only get a few milliseconds, which was nothing, or they could get uh, an average or something like that that you can make over everything. But you couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't stream enough data to see every single bunch because it was over a VMB bus, don't ask. I mean, it's, it's very old. You, you have to remember that things there are, are uh, some things are very old and it's not easy to change and there is, the budget is also constrained. Even if we have 10 billions, it's not easy to, to, to change everything and say, oh, let's, tomorrow we will change uh, the VME uh, cards and the racks and, and we, say, we change everything. So during the first run of LEC, because then it was stopped and then you start again, uh, the, the physicists say, said, sorry, that they needed more. So what we did? Basically, we did a system that had some electronics in the, in the, in the beam and streams the data through an optical fiber that we, you know, in, uh, if you have the, the LEC, you, we put an optical fiber for the 100 meters where the cables go and the optical fiber goes up. We cannot use other protocols or other, sorry, not protocols, other mediums because I think there was some limitations. I don't know about this, I'm not very sure, but I think if I remember correctly, there were some problems if we use some other things because of the radiation or the, you know, you cannot put, for example, you have to do electronics that are hardened against radiation and you have to um, take, consider several things. So they decided that the best thing was an optical fiber and we put the Linux server in the surface and we put the electronics uh, as simple as possible in the, in the underground, okay? So we aim for one minute of data instead of a few milliseconds. That's orders of magnitudes more, right? Five orders of magnitudes more. We also had other things. There is the credit, but well, there's a lot of people that are working that and many other people in other departments because we designed the hardware and the software at CERN. We have to, in many cases, do everything. This is the system overview, but uh, basically it's a transmitter. This would be in the tunnel, okay, in the, in the beam. They go through fiber to some cards that are in a Linux server, which are PCI cards, Express. Version one is very slow, but it's enough. They go through a driver stack that we wrote. Then there's the Linux kernel, which is a custom one that I will spend is a real time. I think it has the real time patches applied and so on. Then there is the software, this is the part I work with, um, and also partly the, the driver stack, which is basically a class in a micro, super micro server, which with uh, 128 gigabytes of RAM. Why? Because we cannot stream through Ethernet all the data quickly enough, and we cannot, the, even the clients, some clients don't even have the resources to manipulate such amount of data quick enough. So what we do is we put a buffer in RAM in, in the Linux server, in the surface, and then people can say to us, what is the data that I am interested? For example, if we detect that there is an instability in the beam, so for example, imagine that the beam is going like this, and suddenly you see a, let's say, a vibration, then you say this is an instability, the, the beam is becoming unstable. So in, instantaneously, you, you trigger, you, you, you send a pulse to the Linux server, and you say, start recording. So start saving a snapshot of that and huge buffer. And you have to do it backwards. So you have to have already the buffer field. It's just that you copy the, 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 the last, uh, like when you are streaming, uh, you know, and, and, and you want to uh, take the record or you are streaming a tennis, uh, you know, and you, have, you want the last uh, play or whatever it's called in English. So that's basically what we do. We also thought about doing a, uh, Computations in the GPU because they wanted to do some Fourier, Fourier analysis on the on the data, but it was not re required. But because the CPUs were fast enough for that, 
and the time actually to, to, to pass the data was uh, bigger than the actual uh, computation and other stuff that uh, these are the RF cavities okay that I explained this is where basically the not here because this is the RF cavities itself but maybe here in a door the, 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 the electronics are there okay in a door you open and the electronics are there so I explained that uh, what we had you, you can read about that they read that uh, 40 mega samples per second the the beam, 40 megahertz. When we have the optical fire beam, we have unidirectional, no synchronization, etc., etc. Then in the receiver, which is more important for us, we have um, uh, basically it's, a, it's a, the module that I said that is a PCI Express uh, card, and there is a driver for that that I had, and also uh, some uh, BSDL that you could configure to talk to an FPGA or whatever you want to put in the mezzanine. And with that, we plug the, the fiber cable, okay? Um, as I said, we could have 128 gigabytes of RAM, but if they wanted to put the money, they could go up to three terabytes of RAM and the system would go exactly as well. So we have basically uh, one order plus of magnitude uh, uh, to expand. People were so happy with the system that then other teams started to say, oh, yes, I want this, uh, buy 10 more, you know, because they were actually cheap. The, the super micro things are actually cheap. It's like one system is like 3,000 uh, 3, euros, maybe, or something like that, I think, with the CPU and the RAM and, and the two Xeons. So it was actually quite cheap. So compared to, for example, an oscilloscope, very good oscilloscope that costs, I don't know, 100,000, 200,000, so I mean, it's, it's nothing. So people started to say, no, no, I, I want this. I want to put uh, an OSBOX on the, for completely different stuff, because it's just a generic system that you plug. You put the optical cable and, and you forget. So they wanted to put this in other stuff. The Linux kernel was, as I said, had the real-time patches and uh, a custom driver. I work with the guy that uh, wrote the driver. This is an overview of what happens. So from the cavities goes to VME cards, fiber link, the PCI Express card, the Super Micro with the motherboard. We had the custom uh, Linux driver there with this framework that probably you have not heard about. Is Federico, my my uh, the, 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 my friend that I work uh, I work with uh, doing that had this framework which is meant for labs, physics labs for for drivers of acquisition drivers and so on. I don't know many details about it, but basically they made it as I explained here. To improve on Comdedi and IIO in 2011. So maybe there is now other better solutions, but at the time they, they, fe they felt that they needed to, to do it. Uh, Federico wanted to come here, but he's on his honeymoon, so <laughs> he couldn't attend and explain that. Sorry. Um, Customize, uh, yes. The, the, so what we did is what I told, I told Federico is okay, don't, don't give me a complex, because I mean, I wrote the simple drivers as I told you in the kernel, and I know what is more or less the interface that you can use to user space. But for this use case, I said, I only need to read. I only need that syscall, and I want it blocking. I don't want anything else. I want it as simple as possible. So with a simple, the only interface I needed is it was a, a read syscall. So what I did, so in user space, I created a real-time process, which was continuously acquiring the raw data from the kernel, because the kernel buffers were very, very small, and the data was so fast that I have to take it out from the, from the kernel uh, quickly. Maybe there are other solutions that you can suggest and so on. This, I guess, was the easiest at the time. Federico told me that it was not that trivial to change. I, I don't know, I, I cannot speak uh, for him. But what we did, it was simple. It's a for loop, infinite loop, that does the read syscall as quickly as possible, copies the, the memory, into, um, into the huge 50 gigabytes data circular buffer. And you again ask for read. And as soon as you have it, the kernel gives it to you and there is no other interface to the driver. So that's all the interface we needed. Then, um, well, we have the other support for stuff. Then you can send the things to the network clients, etc., etc. So for how it was, basically it had uh, one acquisition thread per link that did this for loop, basically, which passed 
the, the data, uh, this was the highest uh, priority um, thread, and pass the data to the, to the worker thread through a single, produce a single consumer queue, if I remember correctly. And then the worker threads, which were a slightly lower priority, basically they had to go through the data, find where the start is, because there is, 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 is a, is a unidirectra, unidirectional protocol, so there is no communication, so I just receive the data. And I have to say, where is the start? I have to find a marker, synchronize with it, and then from there on, I find the CRC of the first block of data, and then I, I can say, yes, it was the, the marker, because of course, it can happen that the marker appears in a random bunch of data when you are reading. So imagine a, a stream of data, right? And you are finding, uh, for example, the magic value A, 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 So it can happen that the value appears, right, in the, in the normal data. So what we did is find the A, 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 and then we save the data, potentially. And then when you find the, where the CRC should be, because it's fixed size, okay, assume it's fixed size, the block of data, you then compute the CRC, and if it matches, then the probability is high that the data was, uh, the, that's the block of data. This actually worked, it was perfectly fine. And uh, this was going fast enough for the use case. I mean, the, the processor had many cores empty. The cores that were working were actually not reaching, uh, you know, they were not saturating, so it was actually very nice. We could even use the servers for something else in between. Um, of course, the catches and, and they were probably basically being completely used, but, and then there is other threads, many other threads that the system uses for other stuff which are mostly given by this framework, which is a framework that they use to, you know, when you have a lot, when you build an accelerator and there is, uh, imagine, 1,000 devices that you have to control, or 2,000 devices, individual things, electronics, or individual <coughs> motors, or individual things that you have to control in an accelerator, what happens is that unless you make a, a unified interface to all that, you will get a mess. So you have to make an unified interface for all the operators so that they can know how to use it or reasonably learn quickly how to use a new motor. For example, you added some motor in the cavities, which we did sometimes. So you add uh, some motors to, to some cavities because, for example, in one case, we added some motors in the, in the bronze cavity that you saw in the RF. To reduce the volume, if I remember correctly, the idea was to reduce the volume a bit. So a stepper motor went slowly up reduce a bit the volume, and that was enough to modify some properties of the RF cavity for some reason that I don't know, okay? So to control that, you have to create a, what they call a class. It's not a class in the programming sense. It's basically a, an entity that takes input data and controls some device. It also supplies networking to client. Clients, which may be Python clients, uh, GUI, uh, command line interface, everything. So any kind of device, you have it there. If you access the, the, there is a database actually, there is a huge database with all the devices, all the properties in the device, what you can control in each device, in each motor, in each everything. So it's, it's a huge, uh, it's like having a machine digitalized, if you want, okay? It's like having a huge machine, uh, machine digitalized. Everything is written in C++. The framework and the classes have to be written in C++. Nowadays in modern C++, I think C++ 14 which is nice if you, some of you I know from the other presentations that like uh, or have worked with C++ and when they moved to C++ 14, it was quite a relief to do some things. So this, I cannot, bueno, this is uh, the GUI, the simple GUI for experts, okay? There is other GUIs, but this is the GUIs that you use for development. These are the devices that you have, okay? This is the properties Cycle selection is, because in accelerator you have different cycles for different purposes, for different experiments. So the accelerator is running 24 by 7, but from time to time, maybe minutes, maybe a day, changes cycle, and that's something different, okay? So basically it's like a multiplexing, they are the same machine for many different purposes. So every time the cycle changes, you have to reconfigure everything automatically to make it work for the other experiment. So that's what a cycle is, okay? Here we only have one cycle to simplify. The LAC, for example, maybe has 20 or 25 or 30 and it's changing and, and all the accelerators are changing and you have to coordinate the cycle from one accelerator to the next accelerator. It's, it's a huge thing. That's why Federico, for example, I think, wanted to do this framework to 
uh, also made drivers that could acquire for a given cycle and stuff like this, I think. Then you have the property. So you select which device, which machine you want to control. You select for which kind of uh, cycle. And then you select what you want to do. For example, you have read-only properties. You have write-only properties. You have command properties. You know, it's like a abstracted um, functionality that you have. And this is all functionality. Um, it's like a, the file concept in Unix, let's say. Okay. And then you have uh, this stuff. For example, if you go to a status, it gives you a lot of stuff about uh, how is the device running, whatever you want to put there. You have alarms that may trigger other things and may send a message to an SMS phone of a guy saying, hey, this is broken, we have to fix it, come back to CERN, uh, etc. Uh, and many other things. This is all in a database. As I said, this is all in a, in a, in a SQL database. And then you have the actual, when you open this, you have the actual control. So for example, here, well, this is the parameters of the function, if you want. Uh, this is, <clears throat> let's say, this is the, this could be the parameters and this could be the data that you want to change, okay, for that parameter, for that filter. And then here you see, for example, this is sample. This, if I remember correctly, is the, okay, so I finish. This is the first, um, the first time we saw in the Osbox the beam. So this is the beam, the noise, and this is two bunches, two blobs of particles that were going around the tunnel. So this line is basically the accelerator, okay? If you do like this, it's like you see the, 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 the thing spinning. So conclusion, it's only one slide. So CERN needs to develop exotic in the sense of it's all custom because we cannot use many times, we try, but to reduce cost. But not, not every time we can do um, everything with a standard system if you want, off the cell. So we, we, we have to do custom systems. And for that, Linux is perfect. Okay? O open source in general, but Linux in particular is, is very good. Free, which gives us better budget, okay? <laughs> free as in, as in free beer. It's customizable. We can make the improve the real-time patches, or they can tweak them, or they can do whatever they want. You can debug it. Uh, you, you know all the advantages, and it's also extendable, which is very important for us. I think it's the most important because we can write drivers easily. Okay, yes, you can use another operating system. And you can write drivers for that operating system, even if it is proprietary. But still, they, it's very good to to go, for example, for to Federico's office, the guy that wrote the driver, and, and see him. You know, say, oh, this happened here. I can trigger. I can give you a repo to, to trigger the, the problem in the driver, and we can see everything. It's very easy to debug. So we moved from proprietary kernels or operating systems, Linux, for example, to Linux. Everything, I think, I cannot speak of all CERN, but most of the stuff is moved to, to Linux uh, nowadays, and, and more and more things, I guess, uh, they will be moving on. And for hardware, so this hardware is very good. So thank you a lot, and uh, sorry for the long. Uh, Talk. I tried to put as much context as I could and also explain at the same time an example of what we did with, with Linux. I know it's not detailed enough, uh, but uh, I'm not an expert on all the, all the, uh, all the things. So questions, please. <laughs> Um, are your real-time patches generic enough that you can submit it upstream? Submit them upstream. I think they use the the the, the ones of RT Linux, I think, and maybe they tweak them. But again, the problem with this is that CERN is so big that, for example, I work, I wrote, even if I had experience on the kernel, and I could work on the team of the driver and, and talk to Federico and so on, I didn't have the responsibility of that. So basically, the team. Worked on the team working on the real-time patches is completely, I don't even know the, the people there. So it's so off that, sorry, I, I cannot answer. Okay. I guess they could upstream. But as you know, it's, it's, there is no time, basically, for, for everything. Else. I was going to ask the same question, but I was going to say, can you get in touch with them to make sure? I'm actually on the real, I'm on the real-time team. I work okay. on the real-time patches, uh, though. So uh, we'd be very interested to know if there's any things you're tweaking. Please push them upstream. Do not have them pushed off. And yeah. The Especially problem is that usually, I think, the problem is that, apart from the time, because basically CERN is a bit over as many companies, right? But I mean, it's, yeah. it's, in some teams in particular, it's like they are, have a backlog of infinite backlog. So 
I guess the problem is, yeah. Well, if you could look at the patches themselves and say, hey, this doesn't match, you send them up. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> the thing is, first, I would have to get access to the, to the repository. Uh, it's, you know, it's 14,000 uh, people, which is, uh, <coughs> sometimes I don't even know, you know, I could go to, to someone that can make contact with, with them, but still probably they say, well, we changed this uh, two years ago, it's working, we cannot even touch it. So the problem with many things that you change, yeah. in the kernel or wherever else, is that there is no even, sometimes there is only one hardware. So let, 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 me, let me put the other example. One day I, I was at CERN and I had to, there was a VME board, okay? And I had to, they told me, okay, in two hours, in this two hour frame that we are going to stop the machine, you have to put this new high level driver. It was not a driver, it's like the, the application, but you can say it's like a driver. You have to replace the, the driver with a new version that does these few new things. And there is no way I can test it. I cannot even run the code because there is no even hardware similar. And I don't have the time to, you know, there is not even a second or a prototype of the, of the BM board. Sometimes there is a unique BM board. And yeah. So there is, sometimes there is not even, they don't even want to risk touching anything. So it's not an excuse. It's, it's, let me say it's a bit, um, when there is no, like in a company that you can, you know, it's not the same procedure as in a company that you say, okay, I need a prototype, I will make the changes, I will upstream. How can I upstream something if I don't, I can't even test it even properly before sending. Maybe the word well, Okay, for, uh, I'll, I'll just say this. I, I probably don't care about the driver. If you're tweaking drivers and stuff like that for boards that are unique to CERN, and that's, that's obviously not going to be probably beneficial. I'm telling you, if there's any things within actually the core, core kernel, yeah, yeah, but that's I mean, what we're looking at. If you have anything like that, that's what we'd be interested in seeing. I, I, again, I, I don't know the, the code, but maybe I can imagine, for example, imagine that they tweak something about the, uh, the real-time behavior that works for that, because maybe it's a, it's a hack to make the driver work. It's not like, it's something that is generic for, for everyone. So maybe it's not the general solution, and they know it's not real solution, but it works for that particular machine. So it's very, the things that, uh, for the accelerators at least, okay, for the experiments is different, but for accelerators in particular, it's very, very specific to, to every single machine. Even, yeah. even things that are similar are different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we we'll probably have to keep yeah. going, so. If I may. Yeah. Maybe the beauty of this conference is we have to go with us designing the RT patches on you as the user. And is, you have the need of understanding what you are doing with his own stuff. I mean, the user meeting the developers. Yeah. And what he's saying just is you have to understand what is your real use case. And maybe if it's only a, a patch for yourself, uh -huh. having, his, uh, having Steven or, or the other guys being in a, but in a position to understand what you did, maybe for just one use case, is helping them to have a big picture of what the user are doing with their own stuff. I mean, the real use case, physical use case, not a virtual thing. Or yeah, we could take this offline too, so because yeah. I'm sure people are hungry.